Hi, everybody. Tonight we're meeting with Greg Kucera, who is a wonderful, remarkable, long-term dealer in Seattle, Washington. And um, I don't know. I really respect Greg and his program and his agenda. I know him mostly from talking with him at various art fairs that I've seen him at. So, Greg, were you raised in the Pacific Northwest? I was. Born and raised here. Did you go to high school in the Seattle area? The suburbs, land of lawn chairs and beauty bark. <laughs> the, the, the town where they, for which they invented the intermittent windshield wiper. Um, did you? Where did you go to college? University of Washington. Did you think at some point before you know that you were an artist, and that you would want I, to be an artist? I did think that I was an artist in in school, in junior high school, and high school. I was always kind of the artsy kid who you know, had tremendous facility and all kinds of things. But um, as I was going to college, I uh, got my- Time out, time out, let me interrupt, I'm sorry. If you could get a little closer, I, we could hear you a little bit better. There you go, thank you. So, so I got the BA degree in, in uh, art from University of Washington. And, um, you know, somewhere in that process, I kind of realized that I wasn't really a very good artist. And um, years ago, I was asked by the University of Washington Art School to give a commencement speech to the graduating students in art. And um, at first, I decided I didn't want to do it. And then I thought, no, I, I'd like to do that. So uh, I spoke to them. And I explained to them my history of growing up here and you know, going to the university, meeting all these terrific artists along the way, and that I felt like the best thing that I got of my art school training was the realization that I wasn't a very good artist. And I thought that that was a very useful thing to learn, even if it cost me four years to learn it. And it allowed me then to go on and work with artists who were really much better than me. So what happened when you got out of college? How many years, what happened in the intervening years between graduating and opening an art gallery? Well, I had a, I had a show at a local gallery here, Foster White, almost immediately. I had, a, a, you know, that was in 75, I graduated in, uh, no, sorry, that was in uh, 80 when I graduated. Uh, and um, I worked for another gallery here in Seattle, Diane Gilson, for a while, and um, um, took other jobs as need be to get myself uh, situated. And um, somewhere along the way, um, it dawned on me that I really had great interest in this as a business. I had been going to galleries since I was in high school. My, I had two very supportive teachers in, in junior high school and high school who really encouraged me to look at other people's art. And um, that, I think, was the key to getting me to consider this as a business. So I would go around all the, the galleries here. You know, I had tremendous crushes on all of the dealers. and. Um, um, as I traveled, I went to galleries elsewhere, I went to museums, and um, along with my realization that I wasn't really that good an artist, I think came the realization that if I put my mind to it and looked at other people's art as a possibility that I could do something with that. And um, I had uh, sold shoes to put myself through school. I worked for Floor Shines and for a Marshall Field store here in Seattle. Um, called Frederick and Nelson. And, um, you know, that sales background really helped me tremendously. So that coupled with what art history I had when I was at University of Washington, I took the maximum amount of art history that I could take uh, and, and get a BA degree in art. And I think all of that helped me once I decided to, to open the gallery. And then my second show of my own paintings occurred, it opened the very night after my gallery opened. And you know, back in the 80s, those kinds of shows were planned months and months and months in advance because we had to have postcards printed and stuff the old-fashioned way. And um, so that show was planned, you know, six or seven months out, and uh, my gallery was planned about three months out. And I opened on October 3rd, and my last show of paintings opened on October 4th. And I felt terrible for the art dealer who uh, who had the show, but she was very gracious about it. Was that also at Foster White? No, that was at Francine Cheaters. Uh, Foster White always sort of, I thought, was the archetypal, archetypal gallery um, in Seattle. 
and that it exemplified the kind of art that I feel like Seattle shows a lot of. Um, and I feel like I, I feel like the Seattle market has grown since then. When did you open your gallery? 1983. And I, I feel like your vision has changed since then. Would you say? Would you agree? Oh sure. Yeah. I mean, I, All right. So how did it begin? I mean, I, I feel like you did. You were a print dealer predominantly at first. No, I, I feel like I've always been interested in representing artists, but okay. I did have a degree in printmaking, I understood printmaking, I understood print publishing, and I had a great interest in that market. So I, I kind of coupled the two and created a context for what I felt were very good artists of this region and showing them alongside very good artists from elsewhere and thereby creating a context that, that was maybe more interesting than an entirely regional context. And over the years, my interest in printmaking has has continued, but I think my exhibitions of it have waned. I mean, after a while, there's there's only so much you can do with it um, from an historical viewpoint. You know, once you've shown, you know, by, by I don't know, 1990, we've showed every Susan Rothenberg and Terry Winters and Elizabeth Murray print that had been made in various, you know, one person and group exhibitions. We've done shows for Motherwell and Frankenthaler, Diebenkorn, et cetera. You know, after a while, you're just sort of repeating yourself there. And um, if I work with artists and represent artists, then that's always changing. I think Barbara Krakow really said it very well when she, she said she didn't really want to continue to represent artists because she felt like she would know what she would be doing 20 years from now. But I've always felt like artists are unpredictable enough that you don't actually always know. They are, there is always a, you know, a surprise in the works. How many artists do you work with? Roughly 20 or so from this region and, you know, five or six from elsewhere. Uh, um, various, various artists who we work with just on an inventory basis where I buy work and make an exhibition out of it and move on from there. I don't feel like most galleries buy, most galleries buy much art. Um, mostly they take it on consignment. So that, what, how does that work? It must work pretty well or you wouldn't continue doing it. Well, I mean, sometimes it's the only way you're going to get a show. Like, we, we did an early show for Carrie James Marshall, and I wouldn't have been able to do that show if I hadn't bought the work outright. Um, likewise for Tara Donovan, recently we did a show of her work. Um, you know, Pace isn't going to consign a slew of work to me for an exhibition, but they, they did augment what we had. But, you know, I think buying those things as inventory has always been useful to me. So then invariably you come out ahead from buying art. Indeed. That's the game. Yeah, it is. Um, do, are the artists from out of town, out of the region, more expensive than the ones in the region? Typically, sure. Sure. Do most of your sales happen to collectors in the Seattle area? Um, I, I would say that's, changing over the years that I think we, um, you know, initially my, my sales were predominantly in the area. And then I think over the years of doing all these art fairs, you know, where, where I used to see you, of course, um, we've added ter terrific names to our ma mailing list. And now the bulk of our sales are elsewhere. Um, but then I don't think any dealer in the country any longer can survive on a regional basis. I think it's, it's foolhardy to try. Uh, you know, with the with the internet, with the big wide world out there, why would you want to just cultivate an entirely local clientele? You know, we, we've got, you know, with the beauty of the internet and, and a very excellent website that we have that we've had from the get-go because we've always had employees who were very interested in it and very knowledgeable about it. We've always had a very, very in-depth website that illustrates every object in the gallery, every object, with a price, with a description, with details. And that has helped us tremendously. And, you know, we, in the email, we were selling things to people in Europe or Asia or Canada or wherever. Um, you know, I, I, I'm aiming for all seven continents, but I think Antarctica is going to be hard. I'm aiming for all seven continents with this course, and I'm still missing Africa and South America. 
Have, have you gotten those two? Yes, we have. All right, I aim to be you. It's like merit badges, Paul. It's exactly like merit badges. I've got Australia, I've got Hong Kong, Canada, and lots of Europe. All right, smirk. Um, so, so, art fairs, how many art fairs do you do a year? We're trying to just do two a year. For a while, I was doing three or four, and um, I'm 56 now, and you know, I just, I just don't want to keep doing it. I have a perfectly nice space here at home, and I'd rather be here. So, which art fairs do you do? Well, this year we're actually doing two new shows that we never had done before. We did the Houston Contemporary Fair um, in October, and then that same outfit has a show in Miami called Miami Project. Uh, for the last, I don't know, six or seven years, we've done Art Miami. This will be right next door to Art Miami, so I think very well positioned. And, you know, it's a fair made up of dealers who actually represent artists, and I have more interest in that than in dealers who are private dealers or dealers who represent clients or dealers who are always in the, the resale market. It looks to be a really nice fair. I think it's going to be. It's a very interesting, very diverse, but pretty upscale list of uh, dealers for it. And I Do you think make a lot of sales at the art fair? Is a fair amount of it afterwards, or is a lot of it the exposure and getting seen? How does it break down? Well, I mean, you, you hope and pray for those sales at the art fair. Um, you know, the less stuff we have to pack up, the better. But uh, in truth, I think the the art fair is about being seen. It's it's really, I think, the, the new form of advertising, that you're there, you're alive, you're well, you're working. These are the artists we're working with, and people are paying attention to that. And there are simply a lot of collectors that we wouldn't meet any other way. So once we've got them met, we can get them to follow us up through our website. We can contact them about artists they're looking for. All of that is in play, but um, you know, I used to have the sense that if you went to an art fair, like, I don't know if you remember this, but the first art fair I did was in Chicago in 1985, back in the Navy Pier, and the old Navy Pier. And um, I mean, I was amazed to go there for a weekend and pay more in rent for my space there for, a, it must have been a 10 by 14 foot space or something. Um, that space cost me more than my entire year's worth of rent here in Seattle. And yet, at the end of that weekend, I had made 20-something sales, and I was astonished by it, as were my artists. Yeah, I was astonished by it, too. It was, it was, a, whole, it was a whole new world at that time. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't think that that's duplicatable now, because I think there simply are too many art fairs. Um, you, you don't get that concentration of buyers in any one of them any longer. At least, not, I mean, I, I can't do Art Basel Miami. I'm not good enough for that fair. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a level of commerce that I don't think we're seeing at other art fairs. No, I agree. Um, let's talk about the artists that you work with on an, in an, on an ongoing basis. Um, what, what's the price range that you, your gallery sells work of artists you represent? Well, from in the couple hundred dollar range to 10,000 up to 20,000 maybe covers almost all of the artists from this region. And then um, the most expensive artist that we work with is Deborah Butterfield. I've been representing her for 20 years now. And, um, you know, that those works can sell up to close to a half a million now. Do you consider her, she's out of Bozeman, right, or near Bozeman. Do you consider her a regional artist? I mean, an artist in your region? I don't know. Montana, the Northwest. I don't, no, I don't either, but it's, but you know, to somebody in Miami, it would be. Uh, yeah, well, to somebody in Miami, everything above California is just a suburb of Los Angeles. So. <laughs> um, and uh, no, I, don't there, Deborah, I don't think of Deborah as a regional artist. Uh, she's... It's no, I don't either. But I mean, when I but she lives in your, you know, whatever. Fine, let's just drop it. Um, <laughs> do, um, is there an aesthetic that you know one would associate with your gallery? Um, schizophrenic? You know, I, I don't think so. I think I am just. I get interested in things. I follow them. I generally feel like if I work with an artist and show their work, I can find 
buyers for it. I can create a market for it within within our gallery. Um, sometimes I get surprised by that, and, and you know that doesn't happen. But typically, that's you know we we have been lucky with getting people to follow us and what we're doing. So how many I, artists have you taken on in the last couple of years? Very few. Probably. How many artists have you gotten rid of in the last couple of years? That's the wrong way of putting it. How many artists have you terminated or re the relationship's been terminated? None. That's a compliment to you and to no. them, too. Yeah. The, um, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to, to terminate a relationship to an artist. For me, it's not. How many one-person shows and how many group shows do you do a year? Well, we're doing six-week shows, so we do, you know, ten or so one-person shows in our front gallery, which is, you know, a very large space. And then we've got uh, three smaller, somewhat smaller galleries that we can sometimes do a one-person show in. So in a given year, I'm probably trying to do 16 to 18 one-person shows and we try to do a couple of group shows a year based on, you know, some thematic content or some convention in the art world or some political motivation. Um, do you stagger the openings if, in, in shows that are, you know, on view simultaneously, or do they all open on a given night? No, they all open the same night. You find that you get better, you have a larger attendance with local artists, and, well, you have larger attendance with local artists than you would with Tara Donovan? No, because Seattle is really a, a city that has had a very strong art scene for a long time, you know, a very uh, infiltrated art scene for a long time. So we have had regular first Thursdays of every month uh, openings as a tradition for more than 30 years now. And when I started my business 30 years ago, 29 years ago now, um, that was already in place. but we began a publication shortly thereafter to um, illustrate what each of us was exhibiting in any given month. And that has been going out now for 25 years, over 25 years. And, you know, that, that really supports the scene here. And we, we really don't have an opening any longer that's a lonely affair. There will always be people there. And when we have an opening for an artist to, because we're on a, a six week schedule, we are open for every first Thursday, but we often have openings in between them. And uh, we would we would create an opening for an artist separate from the first Thursday if we felt like we had a group of clientele to to send to it, to bring to it. What happens when you fall in love with an artist at an art fair? Let's say with their artwork. You mean from showing with another dealer? You mean? No, yeah. I mean, do you do something about it, or it's just sort of like an abstract lust? Well, I think there's a lot of abstract lust, frankly, because, I mean, I like a lot of things, but there are a lot of things I don't feel like I can be successful with, and I have to, I have to gauge what I'm going to work with by, you know, the answer to that question. Can you do something for this artist? Is this going to somehow enhance them or you? You know, me to, to work with it, and um, what so, criteria? What kind? What kind of criteria determine that? Oh, just it's a gut feeling. That old, you know, I know what I like when I see it, kind of thing. But um, you know, I I do have to get an understanding of an artist. I I certainly can't just fall in love with the work. Um, I think that that can be very tricky sometimes, and. Um, uh, you know, I have I have terminated relationships over the years. I, uh, you know, I I'm not afraid to do it when it needs to be done, and generally that has to do with substance abuse or something like that when it becomes uh, just untenable to work with. But so the character of the person is plays a part in your desire or lack thereof to work with them. Absolutely, because I I see a lot of art that I like so. If that's if that's your largest criteria, and then from there you have to say, well, of all those artists that I like, which ones, you know, can I work with? Which ones want to work with me? 
which ones can I do something for, then that's an ever smaller subset of that first large group of things I like. Contracts. You have them with artists. Always. Always. Every every artist that we represent, we have an exhibition, we have a, a contract with, and artists who we're doing exhibitions with, we generally have a contract with them. As, as distinguished from consignment agreements? Yes. I find that unusual. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, but I find it unusual. Why do you prefer that? Um, because you can do a lot of talking to people about what you or them are going to do and still come up with misunderstandings. And if you give someone a contract that lays it out in good, clear language, I think everybody's ahead by that. It lays out what our expectations are for them and what theirs can be for us. Is there a term limit on these contracts that are renewed after a period of time or not? No, they're just open-ended in terms of time? They can be canceled by either party within 30 days, you know, a 30-day notice. And How many pages of a contract? Three. Just sort of basic. doesn't get into minutia particularly. Who has time for minutia? People who have contracts. <laughs> Attorneys, exactly. So, yeah, so. Um, this is written in English. Beautiful. Um, how many of your artists live within 50 miles of the gallery? Uh, the bulk of them, you know, as I say, roughly 20 from this area, and most of them are central to Seattle. What, uh, there's two questions that I want to go to is what services do you provide for artists, and what do you expect artists to do for you? Well, the most obvious service we provide is is exhibitions. Second to that, sales. Um, what what they can expect of us is that you know we we mount a professional exhibition. We hold an opening. We work our butts off to get stuff sold. We create a web page for them. We inventory their work. Um, you know, that work is insured when it's in our hands. They're going to get paid for the work when it sells. They're going to get a balance sheet at the end of the year that shows every check that's been sent to them and every artwork that's been sold by them, for them. Um, you know, they have access to their mailing list whenever they want it. Um, any of those kinds of things. Go to the mailing list thing, say that again. Well, we, we let them know who buys their work and if okay. they need access to the mailing list, we're, we, we, we keep it in our computer and keep it, try to keep it updated for them. And sometimes when they have a show at a museum or something like that, a uh, mailing needs to go out. Sometimes it's something more personal. And sometimes they, they ask for that. And then what we expect of them, professional behavior in return. You know, we, we, we state in the contract that they are responsible for all photography of their work so that they control that imagery and they are sure that it represents their work as best it can. Um, you know, we ask them to fill out, you know, incoming inventory statements so that we know what it is, you know, that it gets measured in their studio, that the title gets applied to it, that the title they put on the sheet agrees with what's written on the back of the painting. You know, all the, that little kind of stuff that need to have a professional relationship based on. Who's responsible for shipping? That's why I was asking about the proximity. So I assume mostly it's the artists who bring the art to the gallery. Sure, sure. And then um, you know, working with artists from elsewhere, generally that's split so that uh, no party is inconvenienced by it. Do you do paper announcements anymore? We still do. Um, we don't typically do, aside from the, the mailing uh, of the tabloid that all of the galleries participate in and which we share mailing lists for, we, you know, we send that out to 14,000 people. So I don't really have a need to put a postcard in the mail for every person. But what we typically do to augment that larger mailing is something that we produce in-house uh, sort of like a press release, but with images and you know, biographical information about the artist and information about this body of work in particular. Um, 
you know, that's an eight and a half by 11 sheet that goes in a number 10 envelope. And, you know, we do three or 400 people a month uh, with those kinds of mailings. And they're, they're based on interests that people have to follow an artist. And, you know, the last two years of clients who, who are paying attention to what we're doing. Do most of the collectors pay for the work of art all at once at one with one payment? Most people do, yes. But you give people long, I mean, some people take longer. Absolutely. And we're happy and how long to, how long do you tolerate? Well, we're we're happy to do three or four months. <laughs> we're able to do six or eight months. We can easily do ten or twelve if the artist is willing. But beyond that, we're not too eager to do that. And most people will, will take care of it in a month or two or three. Um, you know, and every now and then I get involved with somebody who says they can do time payments and then, you know, they drag out for a while and that can be a real drag, chasing people down for, for that. What happens when someone wants to bring a work of art back to the gallery after over three years? Well, we also have a resale gallery here in Seattle. And we're happy to refer people there. It's a, Let's talk to me about that for a moment. Well, it's a gallery called Seattle Art Resource. And uh, my mate and I established it five years ago. Uh, he's a picture framer. And uh, we, we own a building that he does business out of. And this is on the second floor of that building. And um, I hired a woman who had worked for me for a dozen years to run it, uh, Jenna Scott, who's you know terrific and very capable. And, so we typically send resales to the resale gallery, but you know if, if something is particularly good, I'm not going to turn my nose up at it. So and other galleries in town use that facility also. Yes. Some of them eagerly, some of them grudgingly. What a brilliant idea! Yeah, it's fun. Because I mean, sometimes somebody brings you a work of—I mean, like they bring you a work of art back by one artist, and they want to acquire a work of a different artist, and that's probably you just solved a beautiful problem. You beautifully <laughs> solved the big problem. Well, you know, it's not without its its traps as well, but it does keep things a lot cleaner because it's very easy to explain to collectors that you know while we value you as a collector, we are representing artists, and most collectors understand that we represent the artist so that the artist can make a living, and um, you know that's. That's a kind of crucial thing to understand if you're going to try to resell an artwork. It's it's going to be in there competing with that artist's primary you know, offerings, and this this kind of takes care of that. How many? How much secondary market selling do you do? Quite a bit. I mean, depending on on the artist, we we, we still work, as I said, with with uh, prints and multiples. Um, so if somebody offers me a particularly good uh, whatever, we're happy to have it. Like right now, we have two Warhol Mao's for sale. Um, we're going to take those to the Miami art fairs. Uh, I just saw one of those coming up at auction in Chicago, and I was surprised that the price wasn't higher. Well, you know, they're they're a bit more up and down, say, than the Maryland's are. But, yeah. um, you know, having two of them is kind of an interesting thing, because usually we would only get one of those at a time. So that's really the only secondary market material that we're taking to Miami. And you know, uh, it'll make a good statement, I think. Interesting. You guys uh, have any questions that you'd like to ask of Greg? I can keep going, but uh, I'm, and I'm trying to anticipate your questions. Raise your hands. I guess one of the questions that somebody's going to ask, and I'll do it for them, is how do artists get on your radar? How do you become, you know, I mean, you, you've said that you don't take on many new artists very often, but when you do, how is it that you've become familiar with these folks? You know, I, th I think that happens most often through other artists that we're already working with. I think that um, that is my most assured um, way of finding new talent. And then, of course, when we go to art fairs, we're looking. When I travel, I'm looking. Um, there are dealers who I have worked with for years across this country and um, people who I trust. and you know, all those kinds of relationships inform what you're going to end up showing. I agree. Um, Lynn has a question. Okay, Lynn. 
Okay, thank you for speaking with us. Um, my question is, how much input do you give or not give to the artists who you're representing about their work specifically? Well, I think that's a great question. You know, I am fond of telling artists that when they come to work with us, that they will not see me very often in their studios, that um, I am not a dealer who likes to hang out in the artist studios and influence them in any way. Um, I'm happy to give them input when they ask for it. I'm happy to give them commercial input when they ask for it. But the artists that I'm working with don't really need to be coached. So I don't, I don't give them, I don't give them that without their asking for it. And then, you know, it's kind of like, you really want to hear what I think? So, um, you know, I, 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 I often speak to the to graduating classes um, from the University of Washington and the other art schools around here, and people often ask, well, you know, how do you, what do I do after I get out of school? And I'm, I, I really believe that in those situations, for artists to create their own um, studio situation where they can get feedback from other artists is, is really imperative for, for their success. And to have colleagues, to have peers, to have people you trust give you feedback on your work, I think is much more beneficial than what an art dealer thinks about it. And um, you know, I, I truly believe that nepotism is your friend always. And if you work if you work your angles through your artist friends and they work theirs with you, the whole the whole art scene and wherever you are is a stronger place because of that network. That's pretty much the core advice that we've concluded in this course, you know, in the same kind of mantra that I repeat an awful lot that it's about relationships. Okay. Um, do you consider the collectors who've purchased works of art from you more than twice to be friends? Uh, no, I consider them to be good clients. <laughs> I, th I think, you know, I, I, I maintain a separation between uh, clients and friends. You know, I, I, I don't have such a gregarious personality that everybody's going to be my friend any more than every artist I meet is going to be an artist that we work with. So I think I'm, I'm selective there. But cool. Does anybody else have questions of Greg? I'll keep asking questions, but your questions are so excellent, Paul. Let's say you've done three shows with an artist. Maybe you'd say it differently. How many shows can you do with an artist when they don't sell and that work doesn't sell before you start questioning the relationship and consider terminating it? Oh, I think that's that's a hard question to get a cut and dry answer for. Um, I think largely that that would depend on you know, what the artist wants out of that relationship. You know, sometimes, you know, sometimes artists don't necessarily need to be a raging success with each exhibition, and they can be happy to have the exhibition. Um, you yeah, know, but what about you? Well, you know, I work with such a broad range of people, and some, some enable me to, to work with artists who aren't selling. So artists like uh, Deborah Butterfield or Darren Waterston or you know, any any number of the local people um, who we do very well with enable me to work with artists who we don't do well with. And sometimes it's about building a market. You know, one of the one of the artists that we work with right now, Margie Livingston, um, in our first exhibition, we sold only one painting, and I loved the work. And in our second exhibition, we practically sold the show out. So sometimes it just takes that little while to acclimate your audience to it and you know then, then there really are people who we have shown for a very long time who, who don't particularly sell well but I admire them I admire the work and um, as long as they're not unhappy with that situation and feel like they could go elsewhere and do better um, we're happy to, to work with them are you sort of media defined as a gallery I mean do you show how much sculpture do you show you show Deborah Butterfield. Um, we show quite a bit of sculpture. I mean, we have enough space that we can do it, and we have an outdoor space uh, as well that overlooks the train tracks here. So um, having that outdoor space is very beneficial. So artists like Peter Millette and Sherry Markovitz 
uh, writing tennis, Mike Sculpture, you know, Claudia Fitch. There are quite a few artists that we work with who are sculptural. But I don't think that I have a, a medium. You know, I, I have I have exclusions, I guess. You know, I'm not a glass gallery. I am that Seattle art dealer who never ever got interested in in that material. And while we have artists who occasionally work in glass, um, it's not a medium that you know, I need to show because everyone else here does. And I think a lot of fine art galleries are not all that interested in glass, but because of Chihuly, Seattle has a fairly glass-centric reputation, right? Well, Chihuly and, and Pilchuk, the glass school that he started, right. so those are those are very important components to the art scene here, and there's a lot of very fine work that gets produced there, but as long as other people are working with it, there's no particular reason for me to do so. I think of myself as a non-breakables gallery. I, I don't want to show ceramics or glass or you know things that are terribly fragile. Uh, maybe I, I just know I have clumsy hands or something. <laughs> How about new media and computer and digital and video? We do some that of that, but you know, and, and I think it will increase as time goes by. But you know, we recently did a an exhibition called uh, Video Kitchen which was about old school video instead of the highly produced Matthew Barney-ish, you know, Lori Wrist and those kinds of video people or, you know, moving image people to, to work with old school people who are doing it in their own home and doing it on their own computer and doing it themselves. Um, it was a very satisfying exhibition for us. It included people like Tim Rota who, who makes some very, very short, very pithy, Homemade videos with his kids, and they're they're hilarious and touching all at once. Cool. All right, Kevin has a question. Kevin, go ahead. Yes, thanks, Greg, very much for talking to us today. Um, my question pertains to the pricing of of the pieces. Do you, in your gallery, would you say is there a um, sort of a sweet spot? I mean, are most of the artists uh, you had said before the range is $200 to 20000 and it just seems to me that if you sell, if you're selling, if you've got more work that's $200, it's not going to be sufficient for the overhead, and, and I'm, I'm very impressed. You sound like a really savvy business person. So do you think about price point when you bring an artist in? Do you think that, okay, I want to fill this particular price point? I mean, assuming that the other criteria is fits your, you know, fits what you're looking for. No, I, I don't think I've ever taken on an artist because they filled a, a niche of a price point. I, I'm I'm not so um, uh, strategic as that. I, I let my emotions guide me more than that. So, um, you know, we don't want to take on somebody whose whose work is priced at two hundred dollars and it's going to stay at two hundred dollars. So I would say most of the introductions we make are in the you know, these days would be in the 800 to $2,000 range to begin with and moving up from there. But there are a lot of artists we have who have small works or multiples or whatever that can be the two, three, five, six, eight hundred dollar $800 things. Um, you know, we, we just had uh, one of those affordable art fairs in Seattle and uh, I elected not to participate in it because I think that Every dealer in this town has affordable art. So going to an art fair named the Affordable Art Fair seemed pointless to me. Um, other other dealers did it and they were happy to do it. Um, we we had our resale gallery do it. It was great for them, but I didn't want to do it. I feel like you know if people if people want to buy art in that range, every dealer in your city and mine has art in that range. Thank you. But you can't make a banquet out of it. Right. I'm always curious about Vancouver and the fact, you know, Vancouver is the closest big city to you, I think. I mean, I don't know, we could call it Portland maybe, but, you know, Vancouver's larger. Um, do you do anything with Vancouver artists? Very rarely. There, there's almost no uh, back and forth traffic with uh, Canadian and American artists. Any reason why? Well, part of it is the, uh, the, the tariffs 
going to Canada, if you're going to work with a, an artist from the States up in Canada, it's a very costly thing to get involved in. So the dealers up there don't do it. Um, there are some, you know, obviously terrific artists out of Vancouver, but, um, you know, no, I, I haven't pursued it. And, and likewise, you know, I don't particularly pursue Portland either. We, we do occasionally work with artists from Portland, but I would feel like any artist in Portland or Seattle or Vancouver really should show in one of those cities, but not all three. Um, because it's it's kind of redundant, you know. They're they're three hours driving time apart, and um, you know why why spend that same energy showing basically in your in your area when you could spend that same energy to show in L.A. or Chicago or you know Houston or New York. I think that would be much more beneficial for most artists. You know, I, I talked to the people in this course about there not being any necessity to show an artist and show in galleries or situations in their hometown. That you know, the world has gotten kind of global, and they should show where there is an appropriate affinity. And you say that most of the artists you are showing are from the Seattle area. Do you feel like the Seattle artists are loyal to a Seattle artist? Do you feel like Seattle collectors are more interested in Seattle artists than an artist of an equal reputation from somewhere else? Um, well, I think I think every region has the right to root for their heroes and their their hometown people who who do well. Oh, and so do I. But I think in Chicago, for example, people sort of rooted. You know, they say, "Well, you're from Chicago. How good could you be?" <laughs> well. Um, you're in a tougher city than I am. I don't know. Uh, I think that um, I, I think it's great when people support artists of this region, and I'm very happy to find the collectors who who don't look outside this you know this region for the art that they want to get. But I'm very happy to find people who have a larger viewpoint as well, because I think that that tends to be an educated eye that's that's looking at a lot of things and sifting through it and ends up with the artists that we're working with. I, I can very much appreciate that. But, but I didn't let, me, ask let, me that, let, me, let me say that in response to your, your statement that began that question, I actually think that you know, wherever an artist lives is the easiest place for them to get a show. It may not be the most beneficial, but if they're, if they're just starting out, I see no reason not to try your hometown, and it makes sense to me to do that. Where, uh, you know, where where artists are visiting us from, you know, Chattahoochee, Mississippi, or wherever, and and they're visiting some aunt here, and they feel compelled to, you know, drag their portfolio around to galleries here. Uh, you know, I think that's that's not energy well spent. <coughs> you know, just because you're visiting somewhere. Um, that that's going to be necessarily the place that's going to make sense for you. I, I, I really encourage people when they travel just to look at things. Just I mean, as I do, I, I, I'm always looking. I never go anywhere without looking at art. And you can learn so much just by looking at what people are showing rather than making the beeline for the reception desk when you enter a gallery and ask them to show it, to look at your work. You know, while I agree with everything you're saying, I think frequently there are more artists in a given area than there are galleries that resonate with their over. And that, you know, and, and in that situation, they shouldn't necessarily try and fit their square peg into that gallery's round hole. Well, that that's that's true too. I don't disagree with that. I mean, I think it, I think I think the world is so big now that you really have to just look at your work and, and think, where does this make sense? I mean, it, it wouldn't make sense for someone in some small town to, to only show in that small town if their art was you know, really good or really adventurous or really big scale. So you have to find that gallery that's going to make sense for you. Yeah. I agree. I don't think I asked, you know, we, I asked where your artists were from. Where are your collectors from? I mean, not so much from, but... What percentage is in proximity to Seattle? Um, well, I, I I still think that the the bulk of our people are not in this area. 
Um, I couldn't put a statistic to it, really. I couldn't put a percentage to it. But if I had to guess, I would think that, you know, what used to be 60-40 in favor of Seattle is now probably 30-70 in favor of the rest of the world. As a result of art fairs, predominantly. And, the, and then secondarily, the Internet. I would say primarily the Internet and secondarily art fairs. Okay. I, I, think, the, I think the Internet is is the leveling device for the whole art world that allows all kinds of things to happen all sorts of places. I think art fairs are an embellishment of those of us who have spaces to show art in. And, um, you know, there, there are simply too many art fairs now to think that there's any one of them that's going to make or break any dealer. And there, there, are, there are dealers I know who do five or six, seven art fairs a year. I just can't imagine it. I'm too happy being home. Yeah, I know that one too. Um, 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 you are one of the few galleries that have prices on your website. Do you make sales direct? I mean, can somebody buy something on the website without contacting you? No, we have no shopping cart. Um, they they always have to contact us. And and, uh, and, and then do they pay by credit? You take credit cards, you must, because you go to art fairs, right? Yeah, credit cards, wire transfer, checks, you know. Increasingly, we see people doing business, particularly with large sums, using wire transfers. I think it's, you know, it's it's that electronic transfer of money is going to govern us in in the future. But I think now there are a lot of people who use it for large purchases. We're happy to take credit cards. I don't really sweat the the discount because it means you've got a you know immediate you know money in your bank account. Um, we always have liked checks. We're still happy doing that, but uh, you know, we're we're basically here to make art available to people. However, they're going to pay for it. We're happy to work with them. And, you, know, and you ask about the the pricing. You know, um, I I know that there are dealers who look down upon that um, idea of putting a price on a website, just as there are dealers who look down upon the idea of putting a price on a wall. But I've never had anybody say to me, I'm not going to buy from you because you put the prices out. You do it pretty elegantly. I mean, some people make it, you know, just too big and too blaring, and it looks like, uh, you know, Woolworths instead of a fine art gallery. Well, I mean, you know, we, we are a classy version of any number of mom-and-pop businesses. So you can do it in a tawdry kind of way, or you can do it in a sophisticated kit sophisticated kind of way, and we do aim for sophistication and discretion. But the, I think the pricing is a very important aspect of people looking at art. How many employees do you have? Three full-time employees in this gallery, and then, uh, you know, a uh, full-time person at the other resale gallery as well. How many pieces are available at the resale gallery at a given moment? 200. That's a lot. Um, do there, most there are racks and stacks just like there are here. I mean, not everything is on view. Will over half that stuff sell within the next year and a half? Oh, I wish. No. I, you know, that that is like any other market. There are simply things that sell quickly and things that don't. And just as we return things to artists who, who we show here, we have to return things at the resale gallery too. It's it's a it's just a function of business. Laura, go ahead. Yeah, um, I just sort of had a, a quick question. What are some of your um, pet peeves when you're working with artists? Or are there things that just really bother you, or things that you would suggest that um, somebody just getting into the game not do? In your own opinion. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Um, how much time do you have? Um, you know, I, I think that I have as many pet peeves about artists as artists have about dealers. So we try to just work through those things as much as we can. My, my, my biggest pet peeves with artists are in the, in the arena of making information about your work available to us. Like, get, getting good pictures of your work. Don't bring us pictures and then a week later say I'm going to have those reshot and then two weeks later decide that it's time to go to a professional and reshoot them again because we're going to deal with those photos every time you bring them to us. If 
you if you can't make up your mind about a title, I say hold on to that artwork until you're you've decided on the title because that just creates paperwork for us. Um, artists who who want to price their work at a specific place and then regret it when it sells. Like, how crazy is that? Really? You're unhappy that it's sold? Um, you know, I think all those things are about deciding what you're going to do and thinking about it long enough to feel firm in your belief of what you're what you're about to do. And um, just as we can't get squirrely with artists about when they're showing, like, we're going to show your work in May. No, wait, we're going to, you know, it's January now, we're going to move your show up to March. You know, that wouldn't work. Um, so we're, it, it's really all about that communication. And I think getting good, clear communication from an artist to a gallery and from a gallery back to the artist is, is just key to everything. Uh, you know, one of the other pet peeves I have with artists is where we work with people who, um, for whom their own, their time is their own. You know, I, I go to work every day. I am at this desk from 1030 in the morning till 530 at night. And when I want to have a meeting with an artist, but they can't schedule because they've got yoga or, you know, they're, they've got to do some other crucial thing in their life, I can find that frustrating. Um, you know, you're talking to somebody who is very disciplined about their their work. Artists can be very disciplined about their studio, but they they can often lose sight of of the, of the distinguishing factors between a studio practice that's very devout and disciplined and going to a job every day, which I do and which my employees do. So. Not not to beat a dead horse, but that's a that's a <laughs> crucial uh, clear. idea yeah. there. Good, thank you. Sure, that makes sense. Um, Greg, how many of your artists are represented by other galleries? Um, probably more than half of them. Yeah, I mean, we we work with dealers in New York. We work with dealers elsewhere for our artists. Um, you know, a few of our people. Uh, have relationships with dealers on this coast. Um, Do you facilitate as an objective of the galleries to get your artists into other galleries? We do, but I, I have to say that I still feel like the artist is generally more successful at that than, than at least I am as a dealer. Um, I, I'm not somebody who's out there brokering futures of the artists that we work with. So I'm always happy when another dealer is interested and I'm happy to help you know, guide an artist or advise an artist about who might be a possible second or third dealer for them. But um, I, you know, generally what happens when a dealer says to another dealer, you know, I'd like you to show my artist. They say, well, I'd like you to show mine. And then, you know, you, you have that, uh, reciprocity that gets cumbersome. So, um, you know, it, it's better when you're not governed by that. What about museums? Likewise. I mean, we of course want to work with museums. Uh, we have an artist, Dan Webb, we just produced a catalog for, and, you know, he and I have to sit down and, and look at our mailing lists and try to decide which museums it makes sense to send that catalog to. You know, it does not make sense to send that catalog to every museum on our mailing list. So we have to think about which ones it makes sense to do. It's a costly endeavor. Does that come from you or come from the artist, the, the latter of the package to the museum? From us. All right, I got more, but I'm going to go to Karen. Go ahead, Karen. Hi. Thanks for doing this tonight. Whoa, there's some fabulous <laughs> echo. Karen? <laughs> Tell you what, type me your question and I will ask it, okay? Um, and if anybody else has a question, raise your hand. Greg, how far ahead do you plan your exhibits? Our, our schedule is pretty full for roughly a year. And, you know, then invariably somebody's got to move their show back. You know, artists hardly ever want to move their show forward, but moving shows back. We look at our schedule as being, you know, like jelly 
a year out, you know, like clay six months out and three months out, it better be like concrete. Okay. And how often do exhibits occur? Every six weeks. No, that's not what I meant. How oh, often does the have a show, years. et cetera? Every two or three years. It depends on, on the artist and what their production is and you know whether they want to always have big shows. Sometimes artists like to have, you know, a big show and then follow that up with a, a small show or maybe we'll show a concentration of one body of work for an artist. I mean, we, there are all kinds of ways of doing that, but I think we, we try to avoid the predictability of having a show every 24 months. Okay. Um, <clears throat> are there online, I'm asking questions that some people have written, are there online art galleries that you think highly of that sell work online, maybe even only online? I can't think of one. Okay. Really, I, I I can't think of one that's doing that. If someone were to send you artwork, what medium do you do you want them to walk in? Do you want them to email you first? Do you want them to send digital images? Do you want eight by ten transparencies? <laughs> what? I, how do you prefer yeah, to be contacted? I love a good website. You know, re remember when we used to try to do that with slides, and then. You know, remember when people would send us DVDs, and you know, I stopped putting DVDs into my own computer. You know, the first time that somebody sent me a DVD where they decided I was going to look at each image for a minute. That's not going to happen. My first time through somebody's DVD or their website or whatever, I'm going to pursue it at my own pace and based on my own levels of interest. And um, I'm not going to let my computer be held captive for an hour looking at one person's work who I may not even be interested in. So I, I think a website is just the best thing that's ever happened to. to if somebody people. sends you a disc, do you pop it in your computer sometimes, never? If, if I know from whom it comes, yes. And that, you know, I'm, I'm actually looking at somebody's work right now, who, you know, that came to me on a disc because I knew what it was and, um, you know, they, they don't have a, a website for this body of work, so that's that's workable. But just a blind submission, no, I, I'm not I'm not going to do that. I have some phobia about putting things in my computer. I don't know what the deal is. I mean, I love I'm happy to look at a website. I'm gladly opening a PDF. If it comes for a disc, it sits on my desk. Yeah. I don't know why. Well, I, mean, I think the the possibility is always there for some sort of sabotage, but. We've maintained a good enough reputation that we haven't anybody haven't had anybody try that, but I'm sure it's. Out. I'm not I, but yeah, that's not my fear. I don't know what it is. Um, <clears throat> how many artists do you know, or how many artists do you work with that work in more than one direction at a time? I think increasingly artists are doing that. Um, you know, we, we have we definitely have artists who work in a couple different directions at a moment, at any given moment. I, I love that aspect of the freedom of artists these days, and, and artists you know who have the possibility of making an abrupt switch in their in their artwork. Um, you know, I, I love that idea. Margie Livingston, the artist that I mentioned earlier, you know, when we took her on, she was a terrific painter of beautiful abstract paintings on canvas, and now she's making objects entirely out of paint. Um, I love those too. You know, I've been talking to these artists frequently about not working in more than one direction because it tends to confuse people. Um, maybe it's just me. And we met with Jason Middlebrook recently, and Jason said, Paul, essentially, you're old school. The priority today is to be an interesting artist, not necessarily a cohesive artist. Yeah, that's and, a very good quote there. Yeah, unfortunately, I did too. You know, so for me, I, mean, I, I, I can see it from our point of view as dealers. It's it's very easy when somebody makes an identifiable expression. I'm not going to say a product, but an expression that is theirs and no one else's, and they and they do that well, and they refine it and they make subtle changes to it. But you always recognize that you're looking at that artist's work. I love that, but I think there are also people who. Um, who are quite schizoid about 
what they make, and that can be interesting too. Michael Darling um, curated a beautiful show um, that was called Speaking or uh, uh, Painting in Tongues, and was about artists whose work is just diametric opposition every time they show something, and you know it has that very schizoid look to it. Uh, even a one-person show, um, you know. I find that a little hard to deal with when when nothing when you have to really search for for connecting the dots. But I I really do like change in an artist's work. Okay, you know I've learned things from doing all these webinars. You know I'm learning stuff tonight. I got called on it by Jason, and I went, well, yeah, that sounds like it makes sense. Um, so you know periodically. Even at my advanced age, I can learn new things and, you know, shift shift gears. Um, I'm ready to wrap this up unless somebody else would like to ask another question of Greg. This is your last shot. Anybody? Andy, I haven't heard from you tonight. You want to say anything? You good, Andy? I'm presuming he's good. Um, I don't see any other hands up. All right. Well, Greg, I think this has been really great. I think that, you know, you bring an awful lot of integrity to what you do. And it seems, well, not only really interesting, but really cohesive. And, you know, you know what you're doing and you do a really good job of it, you know. And I think that, I don't know, I think your whole program just makes a whole lot of sense. And I really appreciate you sharing that with us. I'm going to mute everybody else here so that we can all echo that together. I appreciate it. And everybody, thank you. Good night, and I'll see you soon. Greg, thanks again.